For better or worse, depending on your views regarding how creative media should be produced, reboots have become a major part of the modern media landscape. Stories being retold with a new spin or with the intent of being more faithful to their source materials are quite prevalent nowadays, and anime is not exempt from this trend. In this year's spring season alone, four different reboots of classic anime properties began airing, and I want to take a look at each of these to analyze what each one did right or wrong in regards to making each franchise worthy of being rebooted. With that being said, I suppose there is one crucial question that I need to ask before we begin. What exactly qualifies as a good reboot? In theory, the qualities of a good reboot shouldn't be that much different from the qualities of a good show in general. Tell an engaging story that people enjoy watching. However, there's usually an added caveat for creating a reboot that's not only good, but marketable to a new audience. That being modernization. Modernizing a reboot, especially one that purports to be set in a present era, is important because many issues or trends that were relevant when the initial version of the work premiered simply aren't in the public consciousness anymore. As Zaria pointed out in her video on remakes, Banana Fish has displayed several issues in regards to what it chooses to modernize versus what it doesn't, thus leading to a somewhat less impacting narrative. Now, obviously changing the narrative so much that it becomes unrecognizable is obviously not a smart choice, and narrative isn't the only thing that can be modernized about a series, and we'll discuss alternatives to this a bit later. So a reboot needs to find a strong balance between retaining the spirit of the old while also fitting into more modern consumer sensibilities if it wishes to succeed. A great example of how to do this can be found in Gegege no Kitaro. Kitaro is an episodic yokai series whose manga premiered all the way back in 1960 and has had over half a dozen different adaptations since then. Zaria also discussed Kitaro in her video as well, but I want to focus on the opening scene of episode 1, a moment that instantly earned my respect for this series. If you haven't heard about it already, this series opens with a very blatant reference to Logan Paul and his infamous trip to Japan earlier this year, before swiftly and brutally punishing said referential character. Not only is this a great hook to draw people into the series because it makes use of current cultural discussion, but it still manages to fit thematically with what the show is trying to convey. It's revealed later that this character had destroyed the seal that was locking away the yokai responsible for the vampire trees that sprouted at the very beginning of the episode, which works rather well considering that one of Kitaro's main themes is respect for tradition. And that, in and of itself, is respectful towards the tradition of the original story. So the way the narrative is modernized here doesn't betray its original intent. It may seem like a small, almost flippant inclusion, but the fact that they included a real-life event that many found to be utterly atrocious shows that the writers are very much concerned with building an empathetic relationship with the audience. But it isn't just the narrative elements that Kitaro updates for its most recent adaptation. The overall aesthetic of the series has received quite an overhaul as well. Because Kitaro is such an old franchise, its overall design choices are... well, let's call them what they are, pretty dated in terms of what a modern audience expects. I'm not saying the designs are bad, but I highly doubt that many people would take this show seriously if they tried to use the goofy designs of the original series. Some of the reboot's changes are fairly subtle, like removing Kitaro's rodent-like teeth. Others are much more in your face, like how most of the characters in general have adopted a modern design sense, fully embracing a more moe aesthetic. Of course, the yokai can get away with not changing their designs too much because they're yokai, and they're supposed to look kind of off-putting. So with this, along with a huge boost in overall production quality compared to previous versions, Gegege no Kitaro manages to both retain the spirit of its original work, while also modernizing both its narrative and its aesthetics for the current market. But what if you don't want to update the aesthetics that much? And what if the story is more plot-driven and is basically set in stone? What if you're dealing with a classic Shonen Jump series and changing the story or the aesthetics too much might alienate fans? Well, the answer apparently is... make it JoJo. God bless you, David Production. 
Captain Tsubasa is about as straightforward a story as you can get in regards to a Shonen Jump title from the 80s. And while it certainly does have its faults in regards to originality, the reboot's aesthetics are where the show really shines. The overcompressed, visceral sound effects and off-kilter color design of something like JoJo work wonderfully in an exciting action sports story like Tsubasa. Plus, incorporating these extremes makes some of the goofier moments a bit more tolerable. Like in the first episode where baby Tsubasa is hit by a bus but uses the soccer ball to bounce to safety. While the show certainly isn't consistently beautiful or energetic, it's those standout moments that really make this anime shine. It is a bit disappointing that the aesthetics are the only thing that make it stand out, and the adaptation rate does seem a bit rushed in some places, but for a story like this, an aesthetic flair is more than enough to make it stand out. Of course, as I've already said, not every show should keep its original aesthetic or even its original structure when getting rebooted, no matter how iconic it is. And I can't think of a more perfect example of this than Cutie Honey Universe. Cutie Honey is, coincidentally, the second Gonagai manga to get readapted this year, but, unlike Devilman Crybaby, Cutie Honey Universe tries to stick much closer to its original iteration in both narrative and aesthetic, which was an absolutely terrible decision because the original Cutie Honey manga is... well, terrible. I could probably write at least three pages just on how misplaced the elements regarding gender and sex feel, but to briefly sum it up, it don't make a like a goddamn sense and seems couched more in the vein of a gag manga, which I've been told is what the original Cutie Honey actually was, and I can kind of buy into that, but that certainly doesn't make these elements inherently better because they're just not funny. They're just kind of weird and bizarre. Maybe my vision of what this franchise is supposed to be is somewhat tainted because my first exposure to it was through Re-Cutie Honey, which I'm more than okay with since Re-Cutie Honey is actually good, but I'm getting way off topic. Unsurprisingly, Cutie Honey Universe seems to have taken the opposite approach to its aesthetics as Kitaro. Whereas Kitaro updates the elements of its design that would feel off-putting to a modern audience, Cutie Honey Universe stubbornly sticks to its older designs and pays a hefty price for doing so. Universe also suffers from basically every problem that the original manga had. Poor action directing, abrasive dialogue, unfunny humor, but strangely enough, the worst part of Universe is the one area where it heavily deviates from the manga. That being that it starts in Medias Res with Honey already being the super crime-fighting android we know her to be, rather than seeing her origins. Something that is desperately needed since it's been over two decades since the franchise was given a straightforward adaptation. It throws us into this bizarre world with zero context and expects us to just go along with it. To be fair, Re Cutie Honey did this also, but because Re had the visionary genius of both Hiroyuki Imaishi and Hideaki Anno behind it, the presentation of this bizarre world is much easier to accept since everything about it is zany and out of control. But because Universe tries to strike a balance between comedy and drama, neither of which were good in the original manga, it ends up failing at both. So in this instance, making heavy modifications to the original would have been the key to success. But, as I mentioned earlier, changing the original story too much can also become a huge detriment, especially if those making the changes don't seem like they understood the appeal of the original in the first place, which is how I feel about the last reboot from the spring season, Legend of the Galactic Heroes. Now, for the most part, I've tried to avoid drawing direct comparisons to previous adaptations until this point, but considering Galactic Heroes' reputation, I feel it's unavoidable here. Plus, it makes it easier to convey my issues with the reboot. There are a lot of nitpicks I could make about this one, especially in regards to artwork and animation, but really, my biggest gripe can be boiled down to one point that you could understand just by looking at the genre tags on my anime list. The original OVA series is not listed as an action series despite the fact that there is action in the story, because that's not what Galactic Heroes is about. It's a heavy and ponderous space opera that discusses the very nature of war, humanity, humanity, and the pursuit of power in a deliberate and carefully paced manner that slowly reveals dozens of minute facets of its characters' personalities over a hundred plus episodes. 
The reboot, meanwhile, seems to think it has time to squeeze in high-octane space battle cuts that really aren't that impressive in the first place. And that speaks volumes about the rest of the series and what it decides to incorporate into its narrative. The original series is intentionally framed from its first episode as a battle of both wits and ideology between Reinhardt and Wen Li by having them face off against each other in that first episode. While the reboot has Wen Li missing entirely until the end of the first episode, and instead uses that time for mediocre space battles. Not only is this series lacking in engagement on its own merits, but it fundamentally fails at one of the most important concepts that made the original Galactic Heroes anime so highly praised in the first place. There are still a few other reboots from this year that I could talk about, but I think my point has been made. In short, preserving the spirit and intent of the original work while also updating it for a more modern audience is essential for having a successful reboot. There are just as many ways to achieve this as there are to fail, so it basically boils down to a case-by-case -case basis, and I hope that the future reboots coming next year manage to do this properly. Thanks to all of you for tuning in to the first episode of my 12 Days of Anime series. There's going to be a new video out every day from now until Christmas, and I'm going all out with all of them. Tomorrow we'll be tackling a similar element of franchise expansion, but with a much more targeted thesis. So be sure to like and subscribe so you can stay up to date on all my latest content. Special thanks to Jan Rogalski, Rourke Tenjoin, Christine Seibert, Tim Johnson, Call Me Cat Lord, Diane Virzbicki, and all my other patrons for their generous support. My name is Ember, and I'll see you next time.